Good morning, folks. Appreciate you all virtually joining us today. I'm Joe Long uh, and representing South Carolina's oldest and I think finest military museum, the South Carolina Confederate Relic Room and Military Museum. Today's history talk is going to be about a really interesting man. Uh, today I'm going to talk about General Fightin' Joe Wheeler. As I always say, I, any history on video, including when I do it, should be regarded mostly as a commercial for good history books. And today I'm gonna be leaning heavily on a book called A Soldier to the Last. Uh, this is a biography by Edward Longacre, a great cavalry historian of this great cavalry leader. And uh, I hope that by the time I've done my little talk today, you'll be more interested in him and, and follow up on the stories of this really interesting character uh, and I think a great American. So without further ado, although with further coffee, further coffee never hurts. Let's move into today's subject. Uh, and thank you for coming in. I, I see some friends in the list there, and I'm very glad you've decided to drop in on us today. Make sure I've admitted everyone who's requested it. A couple more folks. Welcome aboard. So, Joseph Wheeler, a major general in two wars and two uniforms. And he would go by the moniker Fightin' Joe. One might presume that had to do with his two wars and two uniforms. The truth is he actually had that nickname before the war in the 1860s even started. So blue to gray to blue is where we're going today. Joe Wheeler begins his military service with attendance at West Point and is going to rise so swiftly through the ranks that he will be one of the youngest generals and the youngest major general in American history. But before all of that happens, well, let's take a second with Joe in, in Cadet Gray before we get to the Wild West prequel to his career. Uh, Joe Wheeler was not the most wonderful cadet at West Point. And Joe Wheeler did not compile a great academic record at West Point either. Um, he did almost as badly in military specific subjects as he did in core subjects. Well, that's not the nicest thing his biography could have written. At the end of his first class year, that is senior year at West Point, he ranked 16th out of 22 cadets in infantry tactics, 18th in ordnance and gunnery, 21st in artillery tactics out of 22, and dead last in cavalry. So this future cavalry commander doesn't really have an illustrious start to his career. But then he gets his actual first posting and is sent out west as a brand new lieutenant. He is sent to Fort Craig in South Central New Mexico. And this is where the legend of Fightin' Joe is really gonna begin. Because he doesn't manage to even, Joe Wheeler doesn't even manage to get to his first posting without a fight. He's traveling on a stagecoach to, uh, to Fort Craig as a recent West Point graduate. 
The young subaltern commenced fighting Indians before he was halfway to his destination. At the outset of his journey, he was detailed to guard a wagon that carried not combat troops, but a surgeon and a pregnant woman, the wife of an officer in Fort Bragg. Several days into the westward trek, the woman went into labor, forcing the wagon to halt. While the surgeon prepared for the delivery, assisted by Wheeler and the wagon's teamster, the rest of the column continued west, leaving the little party isolated and vulnerable. And again, I'm drawing this directly from Noseworthy's book, who's drawing directly from Wheeler's own account of that particular incident. No sooner had the child been delivered. That's a tough way to begin your military career, assisting in delivering a baby in a stagecoach. And the wagon returned to the trail, then an Apache war party attacked amid volleys of war whoops and arrows. The three men in Wheeler's party opened fire, the driver dropping one attacker with his rifle. And the, sec the next part here is from Wheeler's own account of this incident. The Indians were after the driver in a bunch. The air seemed filled with arrows. That was my chance. I engaged the crowd, knocking down a horse with a shot from my musket. Then I threw away my gun and went at them with my Colt pistol. The driver came in with his Colt and the Indians we're on the run. Well, by the time he got to Fort Craig and uh, this story was passed around, um, he would get, of course, congratulations and the nickname Fightin' Joe. Uh, and this nickname, this new nickname was actually quite welcome to the young man. It was common back in those days to get a nickname while you were at West Point and those nicknames were never flattering. For instance, Jim Stewart was nicknamed Beauty because he was ugly. Um, and Joe Wheeler had been nicknamed Point. The reason he was nicknamed Point, as another cadet put it, was he had neither length nor breadth nor depth. He was a physically small man. A couple of years later, one of Wheeler's troops is gonna write about him, uh, that he is five foot two, and 120 pounds with a rock in each pocket and his hair combed down wet. Another couple of participants, thank you all for joining us today. We've gotten Joe Wheeler as far as his first duty posting with the US Army at Fort Craig in New Mexico. That's not gonna last very long. His Western service with the US Army is very brief because with secession, Young Joe Wheeler is going to choose to go with the South. Now, it's interesting, his family had branches in both parts of the country, in both regions, and uh, working some family connections. When Joe Wheeler was appointed to West Point as a cadet, he was appointed from New York State. He helped fill New York's quota of cadets that year. But Wheeler is uh, a strong Southerner in his opinions. Uh, and uh, anybody that wants to dig deeper can look up his 1896 speech about the causes of the war in the 1860s, something he never wavered on. So Joe Wheeler goes with the South and as a West Point graduate and a uh, fiery young officer with a strong leadership temperament, uh, he rises in the ranks quite quickly. And since we have a lot of his career to cover today, Again, if you want to dig deep, this is a great book. So is the much older book, Campaigns of Wheeler and His Cavalry. That'll give you a lot of detail by a veteran of his command on what he was doing in the 1860s. Welcome aboard. Thank you, folks. Keep coming in. It's quite flattering. Thank you all for joining us for some history during quarantine. So, We've gotten Wheeler through the Wild West prequel to his career. Now in the Confederate Army, Joe Wheeler is gonna work for a very difficult boss. Uh, the fellow we're looking at here is Braxton Bragg. Wait, that's just the fellow I'm looking at. One moment, folks. <laughs> 
So we've got Joe Wheeler as far as his first duty post and into the Confederate Army. He's going to wind up commanding the cavalry of the Army of Tennessee. Uh, there are two main Confederate armies. And the commander of General Lee's cavalry, the Army of Northern Virginia, is going to be one of the most famous soldiers, one of the most well-known of the Confederate High Command, General Jeb Stuart. And General Jeb Stuart is promoted all the way to Lieutenant General. Today, that's a, a three-star general. And Joe Wheeler is doing the same job in the other main Confederate army. He's not nearly as famous as General Stewart is. And one reason that he's not as famous is that he's working under really difficult conditions. Uh, Joe Wheeler is working for none other than Braxton Bragg, one of the most difficult men in the Confederate army. And that is saying a lot. Um, so Joe Wheeler, his job is as the cavalry commander, his job very often is covering Braxton Bragg's retreats. That is not a glamorous job. It's hard work. It takes tactical smarts. And when you're all done with the job of helping the army successfully retreat by covering them with the cavalry, you don't have paintings made of your great charges or the kind of things that happened to Jeb Stewart, simply because uh, it's not glamorous work. It's difficult work, it's important work, but it is not glamorous work. As I said, a diminutive man, a fiery man. Uh, he was described as, uh, as active as a cat and even as restless as a disembodied spirit as a Confederate commander in his 20s. In fact, uh, Joe Wheeler was nicknamed the War Baby for his youth in command. And I always thought that was something his men sort of said behind his back. Um, you know, it's, it's the kind of nickname you give somebody that you don't necessarily tell them, especially if they're your commanding officer. But you know what, if that was the case, nevertheless, um, Joe Wheeler must have learned about his own nickname because an account from 1865 shows that at one point he rode into the camp uh, very early in the morning after a long strategic planning meeting. Uh, it was two or three in the morning when he galloped his horse down between the tents of his men, shouting to rouse them to leave on a uh, before dawn mission. And he galloped up and down shouting, get up, get up, the war baby rides tonight. Uh, I'd like to think that he was actually sharing at that point the fact that um, he knew what his nickname was. Um, but whether or not that's the case, uh, we know that um, he certainly was aware that they were calling him the war baby. Well, Joe Wheeler, is gonna keep those high spirits and that sort of aggressive attitude uh, throughout the end of the campaign, uh, a campaign which is very difficult for him. After Atlanta falls, Joe Wheeler's troops' main job is to slow down Sherman. And slowing down Sherman is a frustrating, difficult work. Uh, you know you're not actually going to win in that kind of situation. He is once more uh, covering a Confederate Army's retreat. And this time, it is a retreat all the way across South Carolina. Uh, a couple of big events happened during that retreat that are still commemorated locally. One of them is the Battle of Aiken. At the Battle of Aiken, Joe Wheeler is gonna come up against his rival in the Union Army, Sherman's cavalry commander, a man named Hugh Judson Kilpatrick. Now, Kilpatrick is also a West Point graduate. Kilpatrick is also a man, uh, of diminutive size and active attitude. Kilpatrick's soldiers have nicknamed him Little Kill. 
Uh, and on days when they're in a worse mood, they refer to him as kill cavalry, referring to themselves, not the enemy. Well, the very tactically clever uh, Joe Wheeler is actually able to catch Little Kill by surprise at the Battle of Aiken. And in that fight uh, between horsemen, much of it actually happens downtown in the town of Aiken at that time. Uh, soldiers are shooting at one another over people's porches and around people's houses. One of Wheeler's officers falls in a lady's front yard uh, and she dashes out of the house, uh, risking stray bullets to pull him back in. But Wheeler's soldiers triumph and Kilpatrick is driven from the battle in haste. In fact, Kilpatrick is gonna leave behind his hat in that particular engagement. So uh, Wheeler's successes amidst a losing campaign are sometimes considerable. He's gonna have another success against Kilpatrick at Monroe's Crossroads. But in between, there's a lot of controversy that uh, attends Wheeler's cavalry. His men are Western soldiers. They're from Kentucky, they're from Arkansas, they've grown up sort of in the backwoods. Uh, they're not particularly well equipped. Joe Wheeler's men are actually using, uh, in many cases, things they've picked up along the way because it's been so long since they've been issued equipment in a lot of cases. They don't look often so much like soldiers as they do like extras from a spaghetti western. Uh, their clothing is in tatters and irregular. Sometimes they're wearing pieces of Union uniforms that have been captured. Uh, their weapons are sort of a polyglot assortment. In fact, at one point, they even, Joe, you're not the host anymore. Hmm. Well, I hope whoever the host is lets me keep talking. Um, yes, even though uh, the, they're not well equipped and well armed, Wheeler makes the most of the resources he has. At one point, he has actually gathered up all the weapons and redistributed them among regiments so that he'll be sure he only has to send one ammunition type to each regiment. And two regiments get all the sabers in his brigade and all the revolvers. He calls those his charging regiments. And so um, he maintains tactical options as best he can with limited resources. But his men have a bad reputation for discipline. And uh, some civilians say that they dread the approach of Wheeler's cavalry as much as that of the Yankees. If Wheeler's cavalry, remember, poorly supplied, uh, pass by your farm, the truth is your pigs and chickens are gonna go missing. There's really just no other way to express it. They're gonna steal food. And of course, this is resented. Those are your pigs and your chickens and what you're surviving on, uh, possibly while the men of the family are themselves off at war. But one of Wheeler's cavalry would write in response to this accusation after the war. Uh, it deeply hurt him. Uh, and he said, yes, we took the food we needed to eat and we didn't apologize or ask permission, but we were trying to stop the man who was going to take all of that and burn down the farm. Uh, so they felt that their sometimes ruffianly behavior was justified Nevertheless, they had a bad reputation for discipline. And it only got worse in Columbia, South Carolina itself. Uh, when Wheeler retreated into Columbia, one of the last things uh, that would happen, his men fought skirmishes both at Red Bank and Congaree Creek, two places on the west side of the Congaree River, and then retreated over the last remaining bridge into Columbia where Wheeler had a section of artillery assigned to blow up the covered bridge uh, as soon as he was on it. Uh, as a good commander, he sat on his horse next to the bridge, waiting for his troops to arrive. He said when the last man from his command had crossed over the bridge, only then would he himself retreat. So that was the signal when Wheeler turned his horse and rode onto the covered bridge himself. Uh, for the young lieutenant on the other side to throw his hat in the air, which was the signal 
to light the bridge on fire and fire the cannons at the bridge supports, destroying it to slow down Sherman for an additional day. But that night, Wheeler's troops, believing that the Yankees would have captured the town the next day and that there was a perfectly good liquor store downtown, Joe Wheeler's men, some of them, decide to break into this liquor store and make sure that good Confederates dispose of the liquor instead of Yankees disposing of it the next day. Uh, that would actually lead Wheeler's new boss, Wade Hampton, uh, in most ways a much easier boss than Braxton Bragg, to actually ride into the liquor store, uh, draw his revolver on his new subordinates and order them out. Uh, it was a very ticklish situation to say the least uh, and caused some some tension. But the two men will learn to work together well by the time is, the war is over. Uh, they both um, successfully take on Kilpatrick at Monroe's Crossroads, and they both have very colorful post-war careers. Well, Joe Wheeler eventually, uh, after the years of Reconstruction, ends up being a representative from the state of Alabama. He is a um, beloved representative there. In fact, each state is allowed to have two statues in Statuary Hall in Washington, D.C. to commemorate distinguished citizens. And one of Alabama's two statues is a statue of General Joe Wheeler in uniform. So he serves in Congress. Uh, becomes a very powerful Democratic congressman. In fact, he winds up on the Ways and Means Committee, and more than 30 years later, he's going to take a break from Congress uh, that makes him into an American legend. Uh, his fame from the war in the 1860s was not extensive. He was not like Jeb Stewart, a name that everyone knew. He had held a similar rank and position uh, but he wasn't as flamboyant a man, and the Western Army services just weren't as well known. So he's known in his home state. He was certainly known by his own men and students of cavalry tactics. But he was not a household name like Lee or Stuart or Jackson. But in 1898, the United States would declare war on Cuba. And this, or on Spain, I'm sorry. And this Spanish-American war uh, would really catapult Wheeler into national view and into national fame. Because two years earlier, he'd given a speech about the Spanish mismanagement and abuse of Cuba. Uh, like many Southerners, he had sort of adopted that as a cause. And when the United States declared war on Spain, Joe Wheeler immediately volunteered for duty. Well, that's not as impractical as it sounds, because remember, he had actually been the youngest major general in American history. So Joe Wheeler uh, is actually not that old a man in 1898. He's not the kind of guy you'd usually think of for frontline service. Uh, at five foot two with a long white pointy beard. In fact, uh, Joe Wheeler in some of the photographs looks a bit like a gnome. Uh, and these wonderful photographs are in the PowerPoint that I can't access. Uh, maybe we can have a makeup class or something after I figure out what the problem was there. Uh, but he's still in good shape for his age. And for President McKinley, it's a wonderful opportunity to have a former Confederate appointed as a United States Major General of Volunteers. Uh, there are several former Confederates, in fact, who take that offer. It's important to national morale. It helps to reunify everybody. The New York Times celebrates it, uh, that these people who had fought against the United States flag and soldiers in blue were now going to be among the leaders of soldiers in blue under the United States flag. Uh, after he agrees eagerly to do this, uh, Joe Wheeler, there's a story about him meeting General James Longstreet, one of his old Confederate colleagues. And uh, Longstreet is pleasant. In fact, Longstreet himself has been in 
in trouble since Reconstruction uh, for turning Republican. Uh, and now he knows that uh, Wheeler is also taking a step. Some are going to find controversial. So Longstreet told him, Joe, I hope I die before you. I want to get to heaven first and be there to watch Jubal Early cuss you out when you show up at the pearly gates in a blue uniform. Uh, so a colorful moment, an illustrative moment, and it actually turns out that Joe Wheeler is one of our best commanders in Cuba in some ways. His boss, he's again going to have a difficult boss just as he did in um, Confederate service when he worked for Braxton Bragg. Now he's going to work for General William Shafter. General William Shafter is a former Union officer and in fact a Medal of Honor winner. Um, and this biography of him describes him. Their pairing must have turned heads for no two generals could have been more dissimilar in bearing or stature, the wispy old volunteer and the gargantuan regular, his uniform coat straining to hold back some of his 300 pounds of flesh. <laughs> so Shafter is a ponderous man and he has a ponderous leadership style. He's in overall command, and it takes him an extra day to land in Cuba uh, because uh, supposedly of illness on board the ship. And when he does land in Cuba, Joe Wheeler, in command of the cavalry, is chomping at the bit. He's ready to go. So are his subordinates, Theodore Roosevelt, the future president, and um, John J. Pershing, future commander of the American Expeditionary Force, in World War I, two very significant figures there. And Shafter intends to land the entire army and then build a gigantic secure base there in Cuba and only gradually begin moving out. Well, Joe Wheeler considers this to be a really bad plan. It reminds him perhaps of Braxton Bragg or maybe it reminds him of stories of Union General McClellan, uh, who was great at logistics, uh, but not so much at taking the offensive and uh, grabbing opportunities to move forward. So Joe Wheeler is downright insubordinate. His orders from Shafter are to throw out a, a screen, a cavalry screen, uh, to report on any activities by the Spanish, establish security around a big perimeter, and that's all. The first time the cavalry encounter the Spanish at Wheeler's command, they uh, not only engage the enemy, but flank the enemy and then start moving down the road towards Santiago, the main objective of the campaign. And Wheeler sends a message back to General Shafter that essentially says, uh, the cavalry are moving on Santiago, and we sure hope the infantry are going to support us, or this is going to be a disaster. So he leaves, he presents a fait accompli to his indecisive. And Shafter, uh, reluctantly and grumbling all the way, follows up. The rest is military history, a terrifically successful campaign, uh, largely because of Joe Wheeler's insubordinate initiative to move forward. Uh, a little addenda to that, if Shafter's plan had been followed, a couple of weeks later, the American army in Cuba was racked with tropical disease. Um, if they had not moved before it set in, we might very well have lost that campaign to the Spanish army in 1898. Now, speculation, you can always go one way or another about that. Uh, that tropical disease, by the way, was the main enemy faced by another Wheeler. When Joe Wheeler went to Cuba, three of his uh, children were involved in the Spanish-American War as well. Uh, one of them was a young man on his staff. Joe Wheeler Jr. was also a West Point graduate. One of them was in the Navy. His son, William, uh, had actually attended the U.S. Naval Academy and was serving in the Navy in the Spanish-American War. But the third of his children to serve uh, did not hold military rank. 
Instead, Anna, his daughter, was a volunteer nurse. She was the one who, uh, she had already volunteered her duty as a nurse in Cuba, but she was the one who challenged her father on whether at his age he ought to be going off to war. She said to him, don't you think you've got enough fighting between 1861 and 65? Uh, and Joe Wheeler responded to her, well, let me put it this way. If you can imagine a fish who's been out of water for 33 years and he heard about a great big pond he might get into, don't you think he'd wriggle a little? So that was Wheeler's attitude and apparently the fighting attitude was passed down the generations. Uh, not only did both of his sons serve honorably and Joe Jr. would go on actually to become a colonel, uh, but his daughter would fight a battle with the bureaucracy in that crisis caused by tropical disease within the army in Cuba after the war. She did a lot for logistics and medical treatment. Uh, and so she had her own very important military service. And Joe Wheeler's rival during the Carolinas campaign, Matthew Colbraith Butler. Now, this was a guy with whom he had a couple of arguments while they were both working for Wade Hampton. Uh, this was a man for whom he was often competing uh, with whom he was often competing for rank and distinction. Well, Matthew Colbraith Butler was cut to the quick by his old rival, Joe Wheeler, becoming a major general. Butler cashed in all of his chips and all the political favors that he'd gathered in his legislative career in Washington to make sure that Joe Wheeler did not outdo him this last time. So Joe Wheeler's example going into the cavalry caused one-legged Matthew Colbraith Butler, former South Carolina Confederate Cavalry General, to also become a United States General for service in the Spanish-American War. Unlike Wheeler, Butler didn't make it to the front um, by the time that the actual, until the actual fighting was over, he was pivotal in the occupation of Cuba. And unlike Wheeler, Butler doesn't seem to have been sad about missing action. Uh, in fact, Butler wrote that he had volunteered in time for action, so honor was satisfied, and that no real soldier who's been in a battle would tear his shirt off to get into another one unless he absolutely has to. Again, not Wheeler's attitude at all. In fact, when the Spanish-American War was over, he went back into the regular army and was sent to the Philippines uh, to work with the occupation of the Philippines and wound up actually fighting against the Moros in the Philippines, a tribe in the hinterlands that were in rebellion against the central government. Uh, that makes Joe Wheeler a Confederate general who wound up at the very end of his military career actually in battle against Muslim insurgents, uh, which makes it sound like a campaign, uh, a, a military career spanning not just a couple of wars, but um, some very different centuries. Uh, so folks, I know we've been a little scattershot today because of my technical difficulties. If you want to learn more about Joe Wheeler. I definitely recommend Brent Noseworthy's book. I recommend the older book, Campaigns of Wheeler and His Cavalry by a veteran. Uh, to learn about what he's doing in South Carolina in 1865, uh, Tom Elmore's book, Carnival of Destruction. You can find that at your local library or on Amazon, and that one will give you a lot of information about Joe Wheeler's career. And with my usual caveat about any kind of history you see on screen, uh, even at a museum or in a documentary, but certainly when you see it from Hollywood, uh, you take it with more than a grain of salt. Always look at a, a history movie as a commercial for good history books. That's my disclaimer. But there's a portrayal of Joe Wheeler in the TNT series from a few years back, The Rough Riders. And it's, in my mind, a rather entertaining portrayal because the actor they hired, the man they chose to represent five foot 
to Joe Wheeler was none other than Gary Busey. And Gary Busey just chews on the scenery in that particular performance. I don't think he sat down with Joe Wheeler biographies and said, I'm going to bring the personality of this historic figure to life. I think he watched old Looney Tunes and got down um, Foghorn Leghorn, the rooster, perfectly. <laughs> because he doesn't seem on the screen to be portraying Joe Wheeler as much as he's portraying Foghorn Leghorn, uh, just an over-the-top cartoon of a character in the film. But the film includes a particular moment that became kind of a um, one of those memorable public moments. And, um, and this all had to do with the real historic Joe Wheeler having a touch of malaria and a senior moment. In 1898, fighting against the Spanish at Las Guasimas, um, the Spanish line had broken in that skirmish and the enemy were fleeing. Joe Wheeler had been in the front. Uh, in fact, his horse had been shot out from under him. And the little old man with his wispy beard had a single action model 1873 Colt Peacemaker and he was firing that weapon after the retreating Spaniards. And he turned and shouted to his staff. And he shouted in his, in his, in his excitement, would you look at those blamed Yankees run? Well, there was a reporter nearby and this became a story in the news. Uh, and people in general were not offended or outraged, but rather amused that the former Confederate had apparently reverted to the previous war during that firefight. Joe Wheeler was asked about this quote when he got back home. A different reporter asked him, is it really true that you said, would you look at those plain Yankees run? And Joe Wheeler told him with a straight face, no, I was misquoted. I never curse. So an interesting guy, a man with a lot of local ties in South Carolina. I hope I've been an effective commercial today for some good history books about Joe Wheeler. Uh, does anybody have any questions? 